And good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Policy Nuance with Mark Badnick, State Representative in the 97th District. Hi again, everyone. I am Scott Slocum. It's great to have you aboard. We're here with Representative Mark Badnick. Hello there, Mr. Badnick. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Happy to be living in the uh, greatest country on earth during the greatest time on earth. So uh, happy to be, be here on WJOL. Well, I was happy to have you back. I'm so glad we're going to continue on with these series of programs. You see right there at the top of your screen, Policy Nuance. Let me ask you, before we jump in, we're going to hit COVID. We're going to hit the energy bill, which is really important for this area. And I, quite frankly, have not covered that enough during my morning show. So thanks for bailing me out ahead of time. And want to talk about property taxes and some other things as well. But let's kind of circle back around to the origin of this show, the idea and why you decided that we need to do something like this. Sure. I really appreciate this. Boy, I'm looking forward to the... um to the to the energy bill, you know, you talked about the fact that you haven't covered it very much. Uh, it's it's nuance. It's not something that I can write one little email to somebody and, and talk about why I'm for or against the bill. These are complicated issues that we have going on, and I want to talk about them in, in a more thoughtful, complicated way. You know, so much of what's going on right now is we just have. Uh, you know, it's an all or nothing world that we're living in. You know, COVID's the end of the world, some people think, and COVID think that some people think it's a hoax. And it's it's usually somewhere in between, whether it be the energy bill, whether it be COVID, whether it be property taxes, whether it be, you know, violence in the city of Chicago, whatever it is, we need to have a deeper discussion of these things. And that, you know, it's been difficult to do town halls. Uh, a lot of people don't like coming to uh, coming to a room, but you know, then you're on that schedule. This way, we can we can record this. We we obviously have the show from twelve to one on Wednesdays, but then we're able to really we're able to really uh, broadcast that out. I can put it up on Facebook, and people can listen and and, and really understand what I'm thinking. I've been getting a lot of feedback from right. from people, and and a, a fairly typical response is like the show. Don't agree with everything uh, that you do, but really appreciate what you're doing. And, and, and they have a better understanding of, of, of what I'm doing. And no one's going to agree with me a hundred percent of the time. Uh, that would be, uh, that would be pretty difficult. Amazing if that happened, but um, hopefully people understand that we're trying to have a, a thoughtful discussion on how to solve the problems facing the state and, and, and the country. And there's some, some real complicated ones. So it's, it's to get through that, that complicated aspect of everything. Yeah. I think it's important too, for, maybe the Democrats to listen to a Republican every once in a while and Republicans to listen to a Democrat every once in a while. It's kind of like my plea. If you're a Fox person, watch CNN or MSNBC just for a while. I know it'll make your blood boil, but do it and vice versa. If you're an MSNBC CNN person, watch Fox. I know it'll make your blood boil, but watch it because you're not getting everything. If you're locked in to one party or to one network. Yeah, and, and social media exacerbates that as well with the algorithms, right? It, it pushes you to to what your belief systems. I've been having some discussions with uh, with different people in different groups that have been have been listening to the show, and I kind of have a new challenge, and this is a good segue into it. And it's something that I try to do when I have a when I have a belief system. I actually spend more time researching online or watching the news to try to disprove what my belief system mm -hmm. is. It's so easy to have confirmation bias in today's day and age because literally stuff will pop up on your on, on your computer, recommended news articles that will just confirm whatever. If, if you think COVID is the end of the world, trust me, there's plenty of stuff out there for you to, 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 to but, you know, do some research to try to find the opposite. And, and unfortunately we don't, we, we don't do enough of it. And it's, it's a, uh, it's a pretty difficult thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave, leave this little part with this. It's, I really wish in schools we spent more time teaching kids how to think instead of what to think. I feel like we're spoon feeding them stuff instead of instead of teaching kids kind of the process to go through of of really analyzing your thought process, challenging your own bias and own belief systems. And frankly, if you spend try, time trying to disprove something that 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 you believe in and you're unable to do it, you, you have a stronger conviction. You're be, you're better able to articulate your position. You're also better able to articulate it to somebody that disagrees with you because you probably you probably research what, what what they're researching. I'll 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 go right in I'll go right into the the very start of mass. Now I don't think mass are the be all to end all. Uh, we talked on a previous show about um, you know in the real world studies with younger kids. 
Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult. Kids trade masks. They're not as diligent with them. Uh, World Health Organization doesn't recommend them for kids under six. We're taking a little bit of a different path. But in terms of laboratory studies and stuff, when I came out in, in favor of masks in, in the very beginning, I, I just challenged people. I said, send me data that says that, that masks, masks don't work. And I got so many uh, research not. things sent to me. But here was the most, there was a thread in, in almost every research. And you were able to almost use their research to prove the other point. Their research always talked to the fact that the mask doesn't protect the person wearing it as much from the outside. And if you read, would read the whole study, they would almost always say it does provide protectant from an infected person transmitting it to somebody else. And that's really the that's really the point of the mask and something that somehow we've gotten away from with the surgical mask. Obviously, the N95 masks are different, but with the surgical or the cloth cloth cloth, mask, cloth masks, um, we're trying to make sure that 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 we limit the spread. And and there and there's a middle ground. Uh, I'll I'll go right into you know. The mass debate is huge. I had another representative send me um, an article about polling and, and Republicans and independents and, and Democrats in different states. And it's interesting. Obviously, more Republicans uh, tend to be anti-mass. More Democrats seem, seem, seem to be all in for the mass independent split. And it varies per state. It actually, there is more Republican acceptance of mass in a state like Texas than, than some of the other states, which you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily necessarily think. My letter to the governor was trying to be nuanced, to, to use my favorite word for the show. <laughs> and we need to start tying some some data to this. We need to have kind of an end game. It, we, I feel like we took the masks off and then we put them on without knowing what the world is going to be like when when we do either. It's I, I kind of put it to one of those scenarios when it's raining outside and I bring an umbrella when it's not raining, I don't. So the two things I wanted the governor to do is start putting some some data driven that's out there like we had for the regions um, opening and, and closing and reopening. I think it was when we went over six, eight uh, percent, we had a we closed restaurants and we had to drop below six before we opened restaurants back up again. I think we need to do something like that for for, for the masking requirements uh, indoors as well for the vaccinated people. Um, the other thing that was in my letter to the governor last week was. I really think we should probably target, we have these very big regions. And I brought up on the last show the fact that that, that Plainfield is partially in Kendall County, partially in Will right. County. Yep. Will County yep. region goes to Indiana, the Kendall County part region goes all the way to the Iowa border. I think each county can be its own region as long as you use influence data from every county that it touches. And what this will do is instead of having hard borders, you'll have more specific cases where you're going to be able to see where breakouts are on a, on a very small case and then you're going to be influenced by the re, by the counties around you so counties so regions will overlap which is more of how the spread of something like this will happen right there's not hard borders where it's really bad here and then you walk across the street and it's not bad it, it's bad it fades out into something better and then fades out right. into something bad well we're the same way in shannon we're part in will we're part in grundy county and when will was on lockdown and grundy wasn't <laughs> People are like, well, how can this be? They just would drive over this, you know, this line that was drawn on a map decades ago, and then you're just okay. So I, I, I agree with that 100. percent Yeah, and it, it like I said, it, somebody asked me, well, you know, what if you're a school district? How do you, how do you manage this? And there's a couple of easy options. Number one is you go with the worst case scenario for a school district. But number two is if if every county is influenced by a county it touches you're unlikely to have a scenario where the data is completely out between the two counties right because they're influencing each other so if will county touches grundy county at that at that point grundy's county is going to influence will county's data sure. and vice versa so you're not going to have it you're, you're unlikely to have a situation where maybe there's a 20 percent positivity rate in will county and a two percent in grundy just mathematically that's almost impossible right. and epide from an epidemiology standpoint it's very unlikely that a county that touches a county with a huge breakout is going to be completely immune. The other thing that that allows us to take into account is we have influencing from other states and we probably should be using the data from counties that that are more open and have have more spread spread or have a spike and that the bordering state should probably be taking some mitigations early on. I just think it helps target. I think it'll help get get things earlier and I think it'll also by having 
by having kind of a dashboard like we had before, mm -hmm. it gives people hope, gives people a goal. It, it gives people the idea that this isn't going to be some kind of ongoing thing that whenever the governor decides right. to do something, right. he's going to do it. Yeah, we like, we like to see. We're a goal-oriented society. Well, most people are anyway, and they want to see a number. Oh, we need to get to this number. Let's work at it. Speaking of numbers, by the way, this is Policy Nuance with State Representative Mark Badnick from the 97th District. Speaking of numbers, Mark, let's talk about where we're at right now as far as the positivity rate updates on our region. Yeah, so our region's definitely been sliding down going into the holiday weekend. Now, we're going to get some static noise from the holiday weekend. The numbers seem to be messed up. People don't go to the doctor as much. People, things are closed. True. So we're going to get a real good idea. Go, go, going into the holiday weekend, you saw a pretty significant drop, mostly in Will County. But here's what's interesting, going back to the other thing that we were talking about. Kankakee had lower numbers than Will County for a long time. So Will County seemed to have a little bit of its Delta peak and started leveling going down and Kankakee is coming up uh, on the back end. So since Will County has a bigger population than Kankakee County, our region, which comprises those two counties, is dropping. But you're kind of seeing a slide up still in Kankakee County while it's coming down. Now, we did have some. Uh, we had schools open. We had the holiday weekend. So you're, you're, you're starting to see. I was talking to some uh, some doctors over the weekend and. Uh, doing a lot of research on this and the the, con the concern or the caution is is what's going to happen in the north so you have the cross currents we had a little bit of a delta spike clearly we had it it looks like we're plateauing the government has even talked about us plateauing he even talked about we might be seeing some reduction in in, in the mitigations um you're starting to see that plateau go down so you had delta come through but because this is a novel virus and new it isn't into its seasonality yet so now you have the cross current of while well, Delta might have spiked and gone through our area, you have the start of school, which is a potential for spread and spike number one. Then you also have the cross current of, of, of as more people go indoors and as the weather starts to get cooler. I'm thrilled that the weather just looks fantastic for the next week or so. Fall's an awesome time of year. Um, but the concern is that maybe in the north, you're going to see that this Delta wave that we saw is just a little warning. And then we might see something a little bit bigger come October, November, like we did, like we did last year. Uh, that remains to be seen. But we are certainly coming off, at least in Will County, we're certainly coming off the peak that we had with uh, with Delta. You sent a letter to the governor. You touched on it earlier in our program here. Any response from the mansion yet? No response from the mansion yet. No, no response. In, in fact, it was uh, it was covered on. Uh, um, there's a capital facts blog written by yeah, Rich, Rich Miller. Miller right? yeah, yeah. He's, he, he really has all the, all the inside and it, it was posted on there for, for people to comment on. I think one of the most, one of the funniest comments was it said, uh, somebody said my plan had a fatal flaw in that it was a moderate approach and it has to be all or nothing in today's world. <laughs> and I was like, like, you're right. That probably is a fatal fly and trying to trying to navigate. It's interesting when I was when I was doing the letter, I obviously did it and thought it was the right thing to do. But uh, in our in our bifurcated world, it, it certainly is an easy way to, you know, upset almost everybody. Sure. <laughs> everybody sure. seems to fall in the camp of, of, of an all or nothing. But uh, no response yet. I'm hoping that I'm, you know, I sent it Thursday last week. We had the holiday weekend. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I will hear something. I will All right. Back well, uh, you mentioned Delta and what things are going to be like here north because we know Texas and the southeast and Florida, they've been hit hard. What about the next variants, Lambda and Mu, which is M-U or Mu, I should say. Uh, what about those two variants? Yeah, there's uh, this is this is a this was breaking news for me over the weekend. Um, and I, I think we can trust AB7, ABC7, right? I think they're probably I pretty, think so. yeah. pretty trustworthy store. So. So let's go to the, uh, let's see if it's good and bad news here. I'll start with the Mu virus first. Um, here's a quote from, from the ABC7 report I read. The CDC reports that the percentage of COVID-19 cases caused by the Mu variant have been falling since July, and the Mu variant caused about 0.2% of COVID-19 infections in the U.S. the week of August 20th to, to the 27th. So I, I, I saw an article today that was kind of, I don't want to say hyping the Mu virus, but was certainly clickbait for the Mu virus. Um, as of right now, the data, the data looks like the Mu virus, not too much of, of, of an issue. And I, I think that the other data was that the vaccine seemed to be to working against uh, uh, the Mu virus. Now, here's another one. I think we talked about the, uh, 
the the magazine headline. I won't name the magazine that called oh, Lamb the next yeah. Doomsday <laughs> variant. I believe was the was was the phrase. I think it was uh, in one of the major national publications a few weeks back. So let me read you the latest that I have on the Lambda variant. And this is this is the clickbait world we live in. The Lambda vir variant uh, was first recorded in Peru in December of 2020. The WHO designated it as a variant of interest in June of 2021 when it made up about 10% of all COVID-19 infections in South America. However, it now only accounts for about 2.4 infections in South America. And the last case in the U.S. was reported August 17th. Wow. So that's that's once again the policy nuance. That's it, it, it's frustrating to see a, a major publication really talk about something being the doomsday variant, and and, and as of now we haven't had a uh, case reported in the United States since August seventeenth. So once again, it leads to that thing like, boy, we really have to. It's unfortunate that people have to do so much research. Sure, uh, but you really have to be cautious when 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 you see those headlines and don't uh, don't dig into things very much more. It seems like. At least what I'm hearing, and I, I mentioned the discussion I had with uh, an ER doc and a nurse. I happened to be at a, at a party that had an ER doc and a nurse and, and for them. I apologize to them publicly on the radio here for, for just asking them a million questions. I'm, I'm usually not the funnest guy. To, you want to talk pensions at a party, I'm your guy. You know, if you, if you want to invite somebody to come out and, and do that for you. Um, so I tend to get into these conversations and, uh, you know, they were actually, they were, they were, they were, we were having a deep policy discussion and, and, and they were talking about um, some, sometimes the things that they have to go through before they give people medication because people are, are buying into some of the myths around COVID and everything else. And uh, somebody else chimed in and they just asked the doctor, he goes, are you scared? And he said, nope, you know, I'm vaccinated. Um, you know, it's serious. It's 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 hurting people. People are passing. There are breakthrough cases, and there are, there are occasionally the, the the cases where where people get it twice. It's usually people have comorbidities. Um, but in his opinion, you see this fading down. And I've read everything from 2022 to 2023 to this fall. You know, one of the um, the, the R nurse actually said, "What's happening with the Delta variant is because it's so contagious." And it's probably part of why we're not seeing Lambda is the Delta variant is out competing Lambda and sure. maybe even, even Mu. Um, their idea is, is you're going to get it and, and have immunity to it. You're going to get it and pass or you're vaccinated. And you're going to kind of fall into one of those three categories. That it's really the Delta variant is really wiping through so many people so quickly. Her analysis was, you know, maybe we see that spike in the fall, but then hopefully, hopefully that's it. There's other experts that are not just people on, on the ground that think it could be longer. There's some that think that that might be the case as well. Uh, time time will tell, but but the Delta variant really is the dominating uh, yep. variant. And they, no they, they really say they spent a lot of time dis dispelling myths. That's good. That is good. I mean, who do you go for the truth? And hopefully we're finding out some of that uh, here today. Policy Nuance with State Representative Mark Badnick here on WJOL. I'd like to shift gears now and let's talk energy, because that means thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs are people who live in your district, people that live in my district where I'm located. I can't tell you how many people I know that work at Exelon, that work at Braidwood, that work out at LaSalle, just so many people. So where are we? Because when we talk energy here in the state of Illinois, this is also about jobs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Energy is a big part of it. Big, big part of jobs directly and indirectly, right? Because having a strong, reliable uh, energy source is really important for manufacturing and, and commerce and, and everything else. So there's there's a lot of jobs indirectly. And then there's competing yep. interests between the old fossil fuel jobs and some of the solar jobs and then kind of the nuclear that, that bridges the gap between the two. Just got the news uh, last night being called back down to Springfield Thursday. Uh, supposedly to vote on, on an energy bill. Uh, there's a September 13th deadline, um, I think for the Byron plant uh, that they won't refuel it. There's Bry Byron and Dresden plant that are kind of part of these, uh, yeah, Byron and Dresden plant that are part of these negotiations. And Exline has said they're going to close the uh, Byron plant if they don't get uh, some sort of deal by, by September 13th. Um, the, the energy bill is going to be everything put together. I don't think you'll see something different for, for, for each, for each nuclear plant. And, and that's, 
there's a couple things that are, that are important about keeping the plants open. And I probably should start by saying right off the bat, I am 100% for keeping the nuclear power plants open. Uh, they provide cheap, stable energy. Yeah. Um, they're, and they're one of the few energies that kind of the old guard and the new guard like. There's obviously some environmental concerns regarding nuclear waste, but it's not the carbon issue that you have maybe with natural gas and especially coal. And we're actually pretty blessed in, uh, in Illinois. We have um, a pretty big fleet of nuclear power plants, which are, it's kind of a, it, it's a good thing to have in, in, in this world right now. One of the other things that we have in Illinois, people talk about high property taxes. They talk about uh, um, a lot of things, maybe the business climate, tort reform, work comp costs and all that stuff. One of the biggest competitive advantages we have in Illinois is that we actually have pretty attractive electric rates. So it's mm -hmm. important. To keep, it's a, important to keep the nuclear plants open um, because they're they're a big part of that portfolio. I do have issues with the way this went. You know, one of my one of the votes I'm most proud of is is I voted against the last bailout in 2016, which um, resulted in kind of the scandal that ended up in Madigan being gone and 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 lobbyists and, and and other people other people being indicted. So I'm a little bit skeptical about the way that we've gone about. It. So. Here's here's the best information that I have right now. We're we're somewhere in the 700 million per year to 800 million per year cost for this bill within the four corners of the bill. Okay. What I mean what I mean by within the four corners of the bill is just what you can what you can attach to subsidies and direct costs and everything. But what is going to happen if something passes and if something, something doesn't pass and and the nuclear power plants go offline? What's going to happen is, is you're you're going to have a different market. So there is a market for electricity. People do bid. So if a nuclear power plant goes down, the price of electricity theoretically should go up. If we pass this legislation and we uh, force coal plants to, to go down, theoretically, the price of electricity is going to go up. So there is going to be a cost beyond the four corners of the bill. But you're somewhere $700, $800 million. It, it had been as high as as uh, recommended or not, um, suggested as high as, as a billion dollars. Hmm. One of the things that I don't like about the bill that I think is, is bad policy is they're trying to shift the cost of the subsidy more onto the industrial users and the commercial users. Now, it sounds like a good idea in heart. So they say $700 million per year. And they say it's only going to cost a couple dollars per household. Well, there's about four million households, um, and if you take seven hundred million divided by four, let's say make it easy, eight hundred million divided by four million households, you get more like two hundred dollars per household per year, mm -hmm. not a not a couple dollars a month like they're saying. And the reason is is they're trying to backload this onto commercial and industrial users. Here's why. Here's why that doesn't work. We pay for that. So we need to be honest in what the cost of everything is. So if, if you increase the cost of, in fact, I have, here, here's one, I have a list of uh, different different types of facilities. The average cost of electricity for a drugstore is supposedly in, in the Ameren region going to go from 25900 to $28,400, $3,000. It's not a lot, but it's 3000 bucks. Somehow they're going to pass that along. Sure they will. Absolutely. But here, here, here's here's the bigger one. If you start looking at, uh, we have a lot of chemical plants, or we have petroleum refineries right right in the area. Um, a typical right now, an average uh, petroleum refinery will spend over fifty seven million a year in electricity. It's a lot. With this bill passes as is, it's sixty five million dollars they're going to spend. So that's eight million dollars. So when you when you look at some of these big manufacturers, whether it be ADM, Caterpillar, all, all the refineries, Exxon Mobil, Exxon Mobil. They're not just going to look at this and say, okay, we'll, we'll just pay it. And so some people might be paying three or $4 extra month in their electric bill. Other people might be paying for their, with their job. So this is where some of the, some of the cross currents really start to really start to inter intertwine and there's more. So if you look at the $700 million bailout, only about 20% of that cost is actually to keep the nuclear power plants open. So I have a lot of my constituents that say, save a plan, save a plan, save a plan. Well, I agree with you. We need to save the plans. Number one, I really wish we could have open books on, on if the plants are making money or not. Number two, if they're not making money, I wonder why Exelon hasn't tried to sell those plans to other electrical providers, because I've been told that other people would like to have nuclear as part of their, as part of their fleet if they only have solar or natural gas that they, they'd like to add to it. There's a cost plus scenario. And most importantly, I don't want to pay. I think it was uh, Senator Fitzgerald back back in the day. I'm going to mess up the numbers, but he said something like, 
I don't mind a $50 million library, Lincoln Library. I just don't want to pay $150 million for a $50 million Lincoln Library. Well, if, if, if the bailout's only going to cost somewhere in the 150 million per year range, I don't want to spend 800 or a billion dollars sure. yeah. to, to, to bail them out. So for me, it's a cross current. I want those nuclear power plants to stay open like anybody else, but I'm not going to accept any bill with anything added into it on top of it, just to keep those nuclear power plants going. Lastly, we'll get into there. There's MISO and PJM. So the grid isn't one grid. There's kind of, kind of sub grids. Yep. And where we're sitting right now, we're in the PJM which basically takes you got Chicago land and a little bit west up to Rockford and goes all the way out to New Jersey. That's the, the PGM grid. And that's where a lot of our nuclear power plants are. The MISO grid goes from, it actually grabs a little bit of Southeast Texas, goes through Louisiana all the way up to Manitoba. Um, I'm not sure why the people of Illinois should pay a hundred percent of the cost of bailing out the nuclear power plants. And one of the things that I talked about, um, in an op ad that I wrote, and actually, you know, uh, uh, some people brought it up at the federal level. If, if we think that stable power, clean power is important to the country, which it is, um, why, why are Illinois just paying for it? And why isn't that coming from coming from the feds with the with the billions of dollars they're throwing at, at this issue as it is. So I really would like federal involvement. One of the things that I believe is being negotiated in the bill right now, because it's still being negotiated, is that there's going to be a clawback feature um, so that if if the feds do come in with money, Illinois won't be subsidizing that um, and 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 we'll be using the, the federal money. The other part that's, that I think is a good thing, and I, I'm, I'm anxious to see the details of the bill, if electric rates rise, as they're likely to over time, mm -hmm. then our then our subsidy would drop. Meaning, if the if the power if the nuclear power plants are able to make a profit on their own, the subsidy goes away. It's it's not it's based on market conditions, not just solely based on here here here's a blank check. So that is um, that's a, that's a, there, there, there's a lot to to absorb there, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a, diff, a, yeah. a, a difficult vote for them. Let me jump in here. Why won't the power plants show you their books. I think I, just, I know the answer, but what do they well, tell you? Well, I, I, the, the best answer I've actually heard, the best excuse, and, and I literally just heard this uh, at a, a function I was at last week, is there's something that they're not allowed to because of the bonds. Something about the bonding or, or, in the, or in the investments. I'd be interested to hear hear your voice, but it didn't come up a lot in in, in 2016. It's and, and another reason why I advocated for the cost plus, which was like, hey, you get your cost to run the nuclear power plant plus you get a percentage profit. Those are the sorts of scenarios that would be really really easy for me to support. This one's going to be a little bit a little bit more difficult because. We're going to be better off here in the PGM market, which once again, is Chicago land all the way to Jersey. But what this does to the MISO market, um, which is most of the rest of this is, is, is of the state is going to be pretty debilitating to um, economic success now. Sure. So what, what, what's your take on, on why they won't open the books? I, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it is like, behind the curtain behind the you know the iron curtain they don't want you to know maybe it's just a negotiating point maybe they gave you a certain number that they want to negotiate down to come back with a lower number like any other negotiation and and settle in the middle i mean could that be what their motivation is yeah i mean one of the things that they did before so i worked tirelessly against the 2016 bill and i think the mm -hmm. thing that was most disappointing about the 2016 bill was <laughs> We were without a budget for, I don't know, a year or two at the time. Yeah. It was, yep. we had this stopgap budget that we did that got us through the election. And I remember going to the veto session, um, uh, which was after the election. So some, sometime mid, late November. And everything was about, I kid you not, I think it was fantasy football draft and bailing, bailing out a profitable fortune 100 company, I believe, right? <laughs> I'm like, we don't have a budget. We literally have people who are suffering from social services. We've, we've got, you know, all the ser social services that probably come on JOL or that you talk about a lot locally in, in Juliet and the region that, that weren't getting money. And we were going down to give a bunch of money. To, it, it, the, the priorities just didn't just didn't seem to align with mine. That's for sure. 
<laughs> so uh, it was it was difficult to it was difficult to sit through that. And when we they said we need it now, we need it now, we need it now. And the importance back then of a we need it now vote was that you needed 71 votes to get an immediate immediate effective date. Mm -hmm. And they kept saying from a negotiation standpoint that they wouldn't need it. They they needed it now. And I want to say that subsidy to them was over 200 million, between 200 million and 250 million a year. This is actually one of my one of my proudest points. So I worked, I wrote an op, two op-eds um, and I worked all the freshmen incredibly hard to just beat that vote down. I just kept beating it. Everybody said, I couldn't believe why we were doing this. And I got the vote down below 71, knowing that their negotiation tactic was to say, okay, we'll wait for a longer effective date. So the way that it works in Springfield mm -hmm. is when a bill has an immediate effective date, you need a supermajority, which the Democrats didn't have it at the time. And that 2016 was a bipartisan bill anyways. Well, once we beat the vote down below 70, below 71, the effective date became uh, the next July. And that was the last chip and that was the last amendment. And that's what, and that's what made the bill pass. But I will go to my grave cheering at the fact that I say rate periods in the state of Illinois are over $100 million by delaying that increase six months. So it's one of those small things that I don't get to talk yeah, about, but I don't get to talk about very much. And it's one, it was, uh, I think the, the op-ed I wrote uh, after that bill passed was the day I cried for my state. It was, it was the one day I came home from Springfield. I was, I, I just couldn't believe that without a budget and with everything else going on, right. we're literally just going to pass a bailout mm -hmm. for X. Give the money away. Give, give the money, money away. away. And then you saw what happened with, you know, with, with the feds and, and yep. all the corruption scandals surrounding that did afterwards. And, and frankly, I'm, it's, I'm amazed that at the gall to be able to come back and just ask for hundreds of millions of dollars this quickly without it, They don't seem to be as contrite. You know, when my kid does something wrong, he doesn't he doesn't ask to go to his buddy's house, you know, oh. immediately. And it's 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 kind of uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised we're here, but we are. Point of it is, I would think they'd be more more forthcoming of their documents. I want to save the nukes, but uh, I'm not sure how this bill is going to end up. Uh, you're listening and watching Policy Nuance with Mark Badnick, state representative from the 97th District. I'm Scott Slocum. One more thing, and then I want to move into property taxes because that's near and dear to everyone's heart. Not dear so much, but near to everyone's heart. Uh, property tax, as far as nuclear power plants are concerned, um, how much of an impact do they have on property tax revenue in the state of Illinois? Yeah, I was reading, I want to say one of the school districts, at 70%, one of the nuclear power plants is 70% of their budget. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some conflicting con conflicting numbers uh, from some of the advocates uh, yesterday on the phone. I got uh, property tax numbers in the 22 to 23 million range for the Grundy County plant, Dresden, and $34 million range for, for Byron. So these are, these are tens of millions of dollars. And um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of money to those areas, and it's uh, it actually kind of highlights one of the fatal flaws we have in our property tax system, in that because we don't because we don't share our um, because we don't share commercial some states share commercial property tax over a bigger region. So what happens in our state is that if you have a nuclear power plant that happens to be on on this side of some school district line that was drawn in the 1800s because of a farmer and his dispute with his neighbor right that farmer gets gets the bulk of that tens of or that school district gets the bulk of those tens of millions of dollars of uh of, of of revenue and then the school district next to it doesn't get any of it but if you think about a nuclear power plant so you, you know the the one plant in in Prundy, i have people in my district that work at that plant right mm -hmm. sure. commercial properties aren't they're not sending people to the school the people that work there aren't necessarily in the school district of of that particular uh, facility. So what happens is you, you create these big, this, this big spread of these have and have not um, districts. Uh, and then you get a situation if a plant does close, somebody's addicted to that really high revenue. Somebody was telling me that one of the school district that's in the nuclear power plant has heated sidewalks. So they just have heated sidewalks, uh, melts the heated snow. Sidewalk, and, literally? Heated sidewalks, literally heated sidewalks. And so you have so you have some school districts who have heated sidewalks, and then you have some school districts who 
you know, have asbestos that they can't get rid of because they because they can't afford it or <laughs> leaky roofs or where, you know, hey, a big thing that we're hearing about um, that I've been reading about over the weekend is there's school districts without uh, without air conditioning. Yep, so, so you imagine going to school in August when it's hot and humid. Um, I saw a school board meeting where they were talking about in the school room. It read in the mid 90s for a temperature and uh, felt like over 100 because of the humidity. Wow. And then you're wearing a mask on top of that. Um, so you have school buildings without air conditioning and you have some school district that that school district heated, sidewalks. heated, heated, heated sidewalks <laughs> and it, it causes a, a pretty big problem. And, and to, to, to finish up on, 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 on that particular issue, here's what it means down South for prop property tax. So we have PGM, which is, which is really going to probably be okay with, with the subsidies and the nuclear power plant and everything else. But MISO is the region that goes that has most of the state geographically. And the issue with MISO is that it's mostly um, it's mostly coal and gas plants. I think there's there's one reactor there. And I'm going to read you some. Uh, and this is going to affect schools and property taxes down there and mm -hmm. jobs. I'm going to read you the testimony of Dr. James Zolnerik. He was the chief or is the chief of Public Utilities Bureau of the Illinois Commerce Commission, and okay. this was in front of a Senate subcommittee on uh, on energy about the bill. And he said, the bill requires the establishment of greenhouse gas and co pollutants beyond caps for all fossil fuel power plants exceeding 25 megawatts in capacity that will eliminate emissions by 2030. I understand that this will effectively eliminate fossil fuel plants. In January of this year, 25% of the electricity generated in Illinois came from coal-fired power plants and 10% from natural gas fired power plants. The elimination of fossil fuel plants in Illinois that is currently the source of such a significant share of Illinois' power generation will substantially impact energy and capacity market prices and reliability in Illinois. While 54% of electricity generated in Illinois in January were, were from nuclear power plants, they are predominantly located in comment service area, which suggests that Ameren, which is the MISO area, mm -hmm. is likely to be disproportionately impacted by the elimination of fossil fuel generation. It is not clear how Illinois' electric needs will be fully met in the event that fossil fuel power plants are eliminated. I'm going to skip to the end there. As, as MISO statement underscores, predicting how the market will change in response to the rapid and market change in the power generation mix created by the provisions bill is highly speculative, and therefore we are unable to estimate the impact on Illinois ratepayers. Nevertheless, the impacts on electric power reliability in Illinois are likely to be significant. So in that MISO region, what's what's going to happen? We are we are an exporter of energy overall, but in that MISO region, we're an importer. Okay. And we'll 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 tail off this this section with this. In, in MISO, where there's a lot of the downstate manufacturers, one of two things are going to happen. You're going to start, you're going to close uh, coal plants here and you're going to start importing more electricity from Missouri and Indiana, which we don't have control of their emissions. And CO2 does not stop at the border, by the way. Oh, no. I'm sure if you're aware of that, right? So some of these, some of those increases that you saw, either, either the plants are going to move or the electricity is going to be generated over there anyway. The worst case scenario is, you're going to see plants move from Illinois, not to India, but to, not to Indiana, but to India and China. And a lot of that has been going on. So if, if we if we drive out manufacturers out of Illinois and out of the U.S. with with some of these overreaching goals, we're not doing ourselves our, uh, any favors. If in Asia they're they're putting on, I think there's a couple hundred uh, new coal fired power plants which burn dirtier coal than what we burn here, firing off. So it's 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 not as easy to say that this is going to be just wonderful for. Um, wonderful for the climate if we're just shifting the co2 production either across state lines or, right. or, or across the ocean yeah. but what's going to happen downstate is is some of those jobs that provide a lot of property tax revenue to um to local schools where, where they are really hurting it, it's just going to exacerbate that situation it's another another concern so we can keep going into the property tax section. yeah we we got about uh 15 left here so i want to get into some property tax discussion and then i got a couple of questions that people have emailed into us. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about property taxes. Aside from the nuclear power plants, uh, uh, some feedback you've been getting, impact on school funding, TIFFs. Uh, there's a lot there. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a ton there. And, and I did a video a long time ago. On, it's, on, it's on my website about the negative feedback loops, which, which I just hit upon. What happens in the state of Illinois is 
because so much of school funding is dependent on property taxes, mm -hmm. you'll have a situation where where if, if somebody has a lot of manufacturing or nuclear power plant, it'll then attract other business, right? Which will lower their property taxes. The more businesses you bring to an area, the, the, the ratio of businesses to students decreases your property tax rate. Well, the opposite happened, which is that negative feedback loop. So I grew up in Lansing and they have the thing in Lansing, Illinois, and they have the deal in Cook County where they have the two tiered property tax system. Mm -hmm where residents supposedly pay a lower late rate and because they're going to push it off to the to the commercial industrial users. Well, what happened is, is once rates got to a certain point, the business is left. Well, when the businesses leave, you don't have that property tax revenue anymore, which raises the residential rate, which then raises the commercial rate, which makes more businesses leave and you have and you have this loop. So we have a lot of have and have not districts. So I've seen it in in in, in I, where I grew up in the south suburbs. I mean, you have areas where I have a uh, um, I have a friend has mm -hmm. a mechanic shop in in in, in Lansing. The building's oh, worth two hundred thousand dollars, twenty six thousand dollar property tax bill. Wow. And the issue with that, and there's there's areas like this around the state. You start to create what I call an economic desert. So you look at if, if you want to talk about um, good for the climate, you look at areas that have higher unemployment that are close. Look at the South suburbs, higher unemployment, great geography, right? It's, it's yeah. close to the city, Absolutely. train, uh, you know, expressways, everything. It's a perfect spot to put a big Amazon distribution center on. But without some sort of subsidy, a business like that, it doesn't make economic sense to go there because the property tax rate is, is so high for that area so you've got this negative loop you, east st louis is another area so you have the east st louis region down down in uh southwest illinois and you really have the south suburbs that really exacerbate this but you have a couple areas you know zion really got hurt when the nuclear power plant closed in closed in zion so um couple 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 of bills uh a bill that i filed and, and, and an idea the bill that i filed this session was and i think this is this is incredibly reasonable this is on the higher end once you get past about a 3% property tax rate, you're at the tipping point where, where you have to start questioning where in the long term are you really going to get more money. So if you have a if you have a $200,000 house, once you start paying over $6,000 or $200,000 business property, once you start paying over a 3% uh, tax rate, you can increase that tax rate. But all that happens is the value of that building's go the value of that building's go well, that building goes down. I see mm -hmm. it in South suburbs all the time. I see it where I grew up. So one of the ideas I had to say is like, look, you're you're squeezing as much water out of the rock as you can at about three percent. Give some people at least some stability, so that they don't have, um, you know, what I see with seniors having to to leave their home or leave the state right. because of a high property tax bill. Three percent seems to be a reasonable to cap it at the high end. The other idea is to take some of this commercial revenue and do what like Minnesota does and 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 spread it out either countywide or regionally or, or statewide in some sort of system so that you don't have these have and have not districts. So you don't have a, a school district that has heated sidewalks and a school mm -hmm. district that doesn't have air conditioning, right? Maybe one can do without the heated sidewalks and one can get air conditioning. So I think we need to start having a little bit more of a team aspect towards this. You have too many instances where different municipalities are competing against each other. And they're and they're doing different incentives. This would disincentivize that. This would this would allow people to take a regional approach to attracting a business uh, to a region. One of the one of the other uh, big issues is I'm not sure if you're aware, but nearly a third of all properties in the city of Chicago is TIF. Wow. And the issue with that is that that makes the Chicago school district look poorer than it actually is because they're not getting some of that some of that revenue. Michigan Avenue is in the TIF. I've, I've had people show me that live in some pretty hoity-toity neighborhoods, and they show how much money is going to the TIF district. This isn't just blighted areas that are that are that are going to the, going to the TIF. So we need more transparency in TIFs. Um, there's a place for them. I've seen them work. I've seen them. I've seen them be abused. But if you take hundreds of millions of dollars and feed that locally back into Chicago public sure, schools, sure. what that does is that spreads it out for suburban and downstate schools to have a little bit more. Um, a, a little bit more funding on the on the state level. So there's a lot we need to do. Uh, you know, we did pass on, on property taxes. We've been nibbling at the edges. We did uh, pass downstate police and fire uh, pension consolidation. Did nothing for benefits. Actually, there was a very slight increase in benefits, but it was mostly about inefficiencies. 
there's some really small school districts that you have to question. School lead district consolidation is, is a big deal in the area. So there's a lot of things we need to do, but um, probably more questions than answers when it comes to uh, yeah. when it comes to property taxes. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to get to the increase in violence in Chicago. Can we maybe put that on the back corner for next sure. week? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. a lot there. I did a story today. Uh, two guys, three guys get busted. They got weed in the car. Cops pull them over three guns on the inside. Two of them were parolees. The other one had, um, uh, all kinds of gun was, was awaiting trial on a, on a gun charge. And the state's attorney asks for misdemeanor gun possession charges. And the judge goes, uh, excuse me, uh, state's attorney, don't you want to file stronger charges? And she's like, no, we're good. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and this is, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you one quick story. There's, it, there's a real big push for decriminalization and kind of soft on soft, soft on crime scenarios. And I think there can be a rebalancing and rebalancing is different than some of the stuff you're talking about. And the, the, the one bill that I, that passed the house, I couldn't believe it passed the house. And I worked tirelessly to make sure it didn't pass the Senate mm-hmm. and get signed to the law was, they wanted to they wanted to decriminalize a bunch of drugs, including fentanyl. So they wanted to decriminalize fentanyl to the point where it was a misdemeanor to have enough fentanyl to kill thousands of people. Now, there's a difference between ruining somebody's life because of a petty petty uh, marijuana charge or something like that at a young age, and or, or maybe an opioid uh, opioid abuser that needs some help. Sure. But when you have enough fentanyl to kill thousands of people, you're either dealing or manufacturing. Yep. That should not be a misdemeanor. And, and I'm all for rebalancing. And, and it's, it's once again, it's the nuance. Um, it's not an all or nothing scenario, but we seem to be really pushing in the soft on crime scenario. And, and let's, let's. We'll get into all right. Get any questions from, uh, hey, let's do it. From- All right. I got one here from Kathy and this is COVID related. I like these cause they're all over the board here. My mother is a resident at a private independent living facility due to five residents testing positive for COVID. The management is implementing restrictions. Who do you recommend I contact to find out if these are legal? And I'll take that one step further. There's a place here in Joliet. And one person, one employee tested positive. So everything is shut down for 14 days. That seems harsh to me. Yeah, the, the, the 14 days one seems particularly harsh, especially if they can get um, if they can get testing in there. I think this this goes again to the kind of it, it seems like we're using the hammer for a fly all the time as opposed right. to kind of kind of having the, the, the nuance attack to it. I will say this, though, if it's a privately, you know, independently owned uh, living facility, a private business has the way has the ability to put the for the most part put rules in place that they say protect the residents the way they see fit it would be different mm-hmm. if it was public uh versus private you know i have i have people that always want to talk about the mass and restaurants and businesses and and i've i've always held firm i'm i'm a big believer that if, if the bit if the business says hey it makes my people that patron my business feel safe if i require masks and that's what they want to do then you know what the, the business has the ability to uh, the, the ability to do that. So my understanding is is that if it's if it's if it's privately owned, they can put what, whatever mitigations uh, they want to put into place uh, that that they want to. Five residents testing positive is a little bit more than one. Um, yeah. and, and frankly, I'd be uh, uh, I I would want the facility for my parents to err on the side of caution in this particular. Uh, in this particular situation, right. but, yep. but my understanding is, is because it's private that, that, that should be legal. We will investigate more for that. Okay. Just to confirm that. All right. If you have any questions, Illinois questions at gmail.com. We'll be able to get to them this week, but in coming weeks, Joel wants to know representative Mark, can we count on your vote for SB 18, the energy bill? Yeah. I tell you what, Joel, um, talk to me right before the vote. If I have a chance to read the final version of the bill. I think last time when we did a big energy bill, there were 17 or 18 amendments the last day. Um, so I will say that I'm I'm committed to working hard to keep the nuclear power plants open. I'll just have to weigh that against the other uh, measures that are in the final the final version of the bill. So it should be should be tomorrow Thursday. Uh, should know soon. Okay, and this was asked by numerous people. 
the governor in, or version of the governor's imposing mandates regarding COVID as if he is king. This is all happening without any pushback from the Republicans. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, I get a lot of what are you going to do about it these days? <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I wrote a letter to the governor and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if he responds. It's interesting. Um, I, one of the things that I write back to a lot of people, and it might be a little little short and, and trite, but elections have consequences. And you are seeing the consequences of, you know, you have one party rule in Illinois. Um, I've actually had time. I used to joke that uh, I felt like uh, people wanted me to have a pitchfork and a musket because, you know, it's, we're, we're 45 votes. There's only it's it literally a simple math. There's only so much you can do in terms of like standing in court. I have as much standing in court as an average everyday citizen suing, you know, su suing the governor and, and doing things like that. So I try to advocate from the inside. I try to like write letters. I try to try to work uh, uh, as well as we can. I'm not a musket and pitchfork guy. Um, and I'm just going to keep fighting, doing shows like this, trying, trying to bring common sense policy to to the forefront so people can talk about it. And then eventually it's just up to the citizens to, to decide at the next election. Yeah. All right. One last question. We got about a minute and a half. What is it like, speaking of the governor, what is it like working with J.P. Prisker? Whew, yeah, that's a good, that, that, that's a good one. It's, um, uh, he is personally in, a, if, 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 if you sit down and meet with him, he's personally an incredibly likable guy. So if, if he was your neighbor and per personality wise, if, if he was your neighbor and you, and you didn't know that he was a billionaire, he has certainly figured out how not to act like a billionaire. You know, if you want to, everybody does, everybody does the, everybody does the, um, uh, what, what's he like to have a beer with? And um, <laughs> I, I, I've been blessed to have a, a, a beer with, with uh, a couple of people in, in different situations that are, that are maybe a little bit stiffer that I won't, that I won't name, but um, in terms of talking on the phone with or having a beer with or something like that, he's incredibly personal. And, and I, that's probably a big part of why he, you know, he was going to have a tough primary against Chris Kennedy. That was, that, that's a, Kennedy's a big name, mm -hmm. um, but he comes across very personal. He's never lied to me. He's answered my phone. He hasn't answered my letter yet. So maybe I'll <laughs> wait till next week to tell you what my uh, uh, final answer is. But one of the things that I actually appreciate um about the governor is he, while I don't agree with him on a lot of his policies, he's not shy about being progressive. He wants to be the most progressive governor oh, yeah. um, in the country. That is nowhere near I stand. But I actually appreciate that where he's out there telling people what he's doing so people can make a choice versus somebody who's kind of doing it on the sly or right. there's plenty, yeah, plenty of elected officials who try to, you know, act like they're Mr. Moderate and then really go down to Springfield and vote, vote differently. He's not shy about what he does. So if you need to get a hold of representative Badnick anytime between now and next Wednesday, when we talk again, uh, you can call his office 815-254-0000. This has been policy nuance with state representative Mark Badnick. Email your questions to Illinois questions at gmail.com. Mark, we're out of time for today. Thank you, sir. And we'll see you next week. See you next week. Appreciate it, Scott.